And it was during my time as an undergraduate that I came to the conclusion that there was really no conflict between faith and reason. Um, that the encyclical um, Fides et Ratio had gotten it exactly right. Um, that faith and reason were the two wings on which uh, the human soul ascended towards truth. And I was an undergrad uh, from the year 2000 to 2004. Um, so this is when President Bush issued his executive order on embryonic stem cell research. A month after that were the attacks of September 11th. Two years after that was uh, the Massachusetts court redefining marriage in that state, the first time marriage was redefined in the United States. And so it was during that time um, that I was kind of first really forced to think through questions of political justice, um, the justice of embryo destructive research, uh, the justice of natural law theory as applied to war and peace, um, just war theory, and then um, the institution of marriage. What is the institution of marriage and why? And it was while investigating those three questions that that's when I first kind of was like firmly crystallized in my own kind of mind that there was no tension between my faith and my reason, between science and the Bible, between embryology and morality, between social science and theology, that everything was pointing towards the same set of truths. Um, what we tried to do, what Sharif Gurgis, Robbie George, and I tried to do first in the article that we wrote um, for the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and then in the book that we published was to explain just using the resources of human reason what marriage is. Um, so we tried to explain to the majority of our classmates at Princeton or coming from a secular perspective how even on the basis of reason alone the best of this argument concludes that marriage is and ought to be the union of a man and a woman uh, permanently united to each other. Uh, I just give credit for you know the things that I'll say. We've developed these arguments over the past decade, uh, the three of us, and working with other people, including uh, Professor Pat Lee um, here at Franciscan. So this is a largely collaborative project, but um, to give you an idea, Sharif uh, is the uh, lead author in this. Sharif uh, was a couple years behind me at Princeton. Uh, he graduates with the highest honors from Princeton. He goes on to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he then goes back to Princeton where he's finishing up his PhD in philosophy while doing his law degree at Yale. Um, so unfortunately, you got like the B team speaker. <laughs> tonight, um, but he needs to finish his dissertation. <laughs> but that's just to say that there are some people like Sharif and like Professor George who at the highest levels of the academy, uh, the most rigorous demands of philosophy and of law, in addition to being a professor of constitutional law at Princeton, uh, Robbie George is a visiting professor of con law at Harvard's Law School. And he's served on the US Commission of Human Rights. He's currently serving on the International Religious Freedom Commission. These are people. Uh, who have thought these things through and have come to the same conclusion that I have about the comp, uh, comp not just c compatibility, but the, the kind of intrinsic unity of faith and reason on these things. But tonight, I just want to highlight on the reason part. Not because the faith part doesn't matter, but because the way that this debate gets played out in the media is that it's reason versus faith. And that all of the forces of enlightenment and of science or on the side of redefining marriage, and it's just backward superstition that is opposed to redefining marriage. So tonight, I just want to focus on the rational, purely uh, uh, human reason side of this. And I want to start by saying, what's going on in April at the Supreme Court with the decision that we expect them to render in June? As you know, your state, the state of Ohio, is one of the states that's going to be arguing before the US Supreme Court in April to defend its marriage law. Um, back in October, the uh, Sixth Circuit Court upheld Ohio's marriage law, along with four other states. The four states that comprise the Sixth Circuit, all four had their marriage laws upheld. The Sixth Circuit Court declared that they were good law, they didn't violate the US Constitution. And so the question before the Supreme Court coming up in uh, the spring isn't whether my preferred definition of marriage policy is the best, but only whether it's allowed by the US Constitution. It's not whether government-recognized same-sex marriage is a good or a bad idea. It's whether it's required by the Constitution. And so what um, my opponent would have to prove in a debate is that the marriage policy that has existed throughout the entire history of the United States up until 12 years ago, that marriage is a male-female union, that that definition is prohibited by the US Constitution. That's a pretty... Um, tall task, I think. Whether or not we can get five Supreme Court justices to say that 
is another question. But on the basis of the law, it's actually not that difficult of a question. The only way someone could argue um, this is to adopt a view of marriage that sees marriage as an essentially genderless institution and then somehow claim that the Constitution requires all of the states to embrace that definition. Uh, simply appealing to equality or equal protection alone doesn't get you there because equality alone doesn't tell you which vision of marriage you should equally apply to all citizens. What you would have to do to successfully uh, win this suit is to say that one vision of marriage, the vision that has always informed our laws, is actually the wrong vision. But our Constitution is silent on the question of what marriage is. And where the Constitution is silent, it leaves it to citizens and their elected representatives to pass laws. And since there are good policy arguments on both sides of the same-sex marriage debate, unelected judges shouldn't be inserting their own opinions about marriage policy and then saying the Constitution requires them. So this is ultimately the question before the court. It's a question of whether citizens or judges will determine the future of marriage in our country. And so what I want to highlight before getting to the more meaty part of the talk, the actual what marriage is portion of the talk, I just want to highlight some of the legal arguments um, that you should be aware of because I think people uh, in favor of redefining marriage have made a variety of sloppy arguments. It's actually quite embarrassing how weak the legal case for having the courts redefine marriage actually is. And so I'm going to start by highlighting what the court did in the Windsor decision, the uh, Federal Defense of Marriage Act two years ago. Then I'm going to move on to the 14th Amendment, look at both the Due Process Clause, Fundamental Rights, Jurisprudence, and then also um, the Equal Protection Clause. And then we're going to pivot to the more meaty part about what marriage is. Every single time the majority that wrote the Windsor decision, the majority that struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, mentioned the harm of the Defense of Marriage Act, it mentions the fact that the US government was deviating from the norm of deferring to state authority. Every single time when Justice Kennedy mentions the problem with the Defense of Marriage Act, he frames it in terms of the feds not accepting state authority over marriage. Kennedy even wrote, saying that the opinion for the court hinged on this by saying, quote, the significance of state responsibilities for the definition and regulation of marriage dates to the nation's beginning, end quote. Uh, a judge on the United States District Court for uh, Puerto Rico, appointed by a Democrat, appointed by Jimmy Carter, Judge Juan Perez Jimenez, highlighted this. He says, quote, the Windsor opinion did not create a fundamental right to same gender marriage, nor did it establish that state opposite gender marriage regulations are amenable to federal or constitutional challenges. If anything, Windsor stands for the opposite proposition. It reaffirms the state authority over marriage. So when he upheld Puerto Rico's marriage law, he was then calling out some of the other judges who had appealed to the Windsor decision to strike down those state laws. And so this is how he concluded, quote, it takes inexplicable contortions of the mind or perhaps even willful ignorance. This court does not venture an answer here to interpret Windsor endorsement of the state control of marriage as eliminating the state control of marriage, end quote. So if you're in a discussion about marriage law before the Supreme Court, don't allow your opponent to say, well, the last time it was there in the Windsor decision, the court said this. If anything, the Windsor decision reaffirms the authority of states to be making marriage policy. So if it's not anything in the court's precedent with the Defense of Marriage Act, it has to be something about the 14th Amendment. But as the Sixth Circuit Court ruled when they upheld Ohio's marriage law, they wrote, quote, nobody argues that the people who adopted the 14th Amendment understood it to require the states to change the definition of marriage. They pointed out from the founding of the Republic up until the year 2003, every state defined marriage as a union of a man and a woman. And so it's very odd to say that the 14th Amendment, which was passed in the late 1800s, was implicitly a referendum about redefining marriage. And so if you're appealing to the original understanding of our laws, which is what judges should do, it's hard to say that the 14th <coughs> Amendment does this. The uh, Sixth Circuit also pointed out there's not a, quote, not a single US Supreme Court justice in American history has written an opinion maintaining that the traditional definition of marriage violates the 14th Amendment. So if they were to write such an opinion in June, they would truly be doing something unprecedented. 
So then we can look at how they have looked at um, fundamental rights under the 14th Amendment. So there's the Due Process Clause. The Due Process Clause is what uh, highlights what some of the fundamental rights are that the Constitution and the 14th Amendment protects. And the Supreme Court has said that in order to be a fundamental right, it needs to be deeply rooted, quote, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, such that, quote, neither liberty nor justice would exist if it were sacrificed. So understood, think about that. It has to be deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, such that neither liberty nor justice would exist if it were sacrificed. Under that understanding of what a fundamental right under 14th Amendment jurisprudence is, the idea of the right to marry someone of the same sex simply doesn't fit the description. The Supreme Court even pointed out in its Windsor decision that same-sex marriage, quote, is a new perspective, a new insight. Same-sex civil marriage is not deeply rooted in our nation's history or traditions. So whatever the policy merits may be of same-sex marriage, you can't say it's one of the fundamental rights that the 14th Amendment protects. Indeed, every time the US Supreme Court has recognized that there is a fundamental right to marry, it's understood marriage to be a male-female union, and it's given the rationale for why there's a fundamental right to marry as being the ability of a man and a woman to create a child and then unite that child with its parents. So when the court has spoken about a fundamental right to marry, it's always been the traditional understanding of what marriage is and it's always justified that fundamental right based upon the rationale for marriage in the first place. So next, people will point to interracial marriage. They'll point to the Loving v. Virginia decision. And here, uh, Judge Nehemiah, who's on the Fourth Circuit Court, um, he was the one that dissented from the Fourth Circuit when the Fourth Circuit struck down Virginia's marriage law. And he just point out that what the plaintiffs in Loving were doing, they were suing to enter into a traditional marriage that had been recognized in common law since the beginning of common law. And it had been recognized in our nation since the founding of our nation, the union of a man and a woman. He then points out, loving simply held that race, which is completely unrelated to the institution of marriage, could not be the basis of marital restrictions. To stretch loving's holding to say that the right to marry is not limited by gender, is to ignore the inextricable biological link between marriage and procreation that the Supreme Court has always recognized. Judge Nehemiah got it right. You know, he might have been writing a dissenting opinion, but the legal argument that he made is completely spot on. If you go through the history of great thinkers who have ever written about marriage, look at what Aristotle and Plato and Cicero and Lucinius Rufus and Augustine and Aquinas and Luther and Calvin and John Locke and Immanuel Kant and Gandhi say about marriage, you will never see a discussion of race. You will never see a discussion of skin color. You will always see a discussion of sexual complementarity. For all of those thinkers, different theological, philosophical, and political traditions, <laughs> different parts of the globe, different periods of history, they all thought marriage was a colorblind institution. None of them thought marriage was a genderblind institution. And an unknown fact about American history is that the US colonies were the first political communities in the history of the world to ban marriage on the basis of race. The US colonies banned marriage, banned interracial marriage, in order to prop up an unjust system of race-based slavery. And if you're gonna have a race-based system, I used to feel like I got a lot louder. Did that happen? So if, if you're gonna have a system of race-based slavery, to prop it up, you would have to prevent interracial children. How do you prevent interracial children? By preventing interracial marriage. But it's not as if the um, colonies that were banning interracial marriage were doing it out of such uh, great insight into the nature of marriage. They were doing it because of racism. And what the loving decision recognized was that those bans on interracial marriage truly were irrational. They truly did deviate from the common law practice of regulating marriage. They deviated from the entire historical reflection on marriage, and there was no rational basis to them whatsoever, which is why the historical record and all of the great philosophers, theologians, and political thinkers had never made any type of argument seriously justifying them. They were simply a matter of irrational racism. But you can't make that same argument up the male-female part of marriage. Every political community that has left a historical record of itself 
up until the year 2000, defined marriage as male and female. But then, if you were to say there was a fundamental right to marriage, you would have to answer the question of, what is the limiting principle? Because if you say the fundamental right to marriage is just about consenting adult romance, wouldn't that fundamental right to marry have to include all consenting adult relationships of whatever size or shape they might come in? Justice Sotomayor, during the oral arguments on Prop 8 and DOMA, asked Ted Olson about this. So if it was Ted Olson, she asked him during the Prop 8 oral arguments. Um, here's what she said. She says, if marriage is understood as a fundamental right, quote, what state restrictions could ever exist with respect to the number of people that could get married, end quote. Olson had no answer, because if you say there's a fundamental right to marry the person you love, why isn't there a fundamental right to marry the people you love? What would be the limiting principle once you redefine marriage simply to make it about consenting adult love? So the Sixth Circuit Court, when they upheld your marriage law, saw that same exact logic. They said that uh, th those who were suing to redefine marriage, quote, their definition, of does, their definition does too little because it fails to account for plural marriages, where there is no reason to think that three or four adults, whether gay, bisexual, or straight, lack the capacity to share love, affection, and commitment, or for that matter, lack the capacity to be capable and more plentiful parents to boot, end quote. So the six circuits went, well, if you say marriage is about consenting adult love, and child care, why can't three, four, or more adults form that relationship? They can love each other, have affection, they can be committed to each other, and they can raise children with even more resources. So if you really go before the court and sue on that principle, it seems like you dissolve marriage into contract law, that marriage is simply about consenting adult romance. So then uh, your opponent might say, well, then it's not about fundamental rights under the due process clause. It's about the equal protection clause. And the way that you uh, run an equal protection challenge is that you might say, well, there's no, there's no rational basis to marriage. But before you even get to that, you could say, well, we don't even need to get to that because we can point out that marriage laws were just a matter of animus. That the only reason um, the state of Ohio passed its marriage law was because the citizens don't like gay people. And they passed marriage as the unit of a man and a woman precisely to exclude gays and lesbians. But here again, the historical record simply flies in the face of that. Because it's not as if Ohio changed its definition of marriage in 2004 when your citizens voted for the Constitutional Amendment. Ohio just reaffirmed the definition of marriage which it had always had, and it placed it into the Constitution to ensure that if marriage were to be redefined, it would happen democratically. All the citizens were doing was reaffirming the historic definition they had always had, and it makes no sense to suggest that when Ohio became a state, the reason they defined marriage in the 1800s as the union of a man and a woman was because of anti-gay animus. That's as ludicrous as saying that the ancient Greeks defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman because of anti-gay animus. When Plato, at least Plato's Socrates, says some rather positive things about um, male and male sexual relationships. So even societies that were um, supportive or embracing of male same-sex relationships never thought they were marriages. And it's not as if it was just anti-gay bigotry that led them to this conclusion. So you can't make that historical argument that it's just like a ban on interracial marriage, for example. We have societies that did, knew, never knew about sexual orientation, never knew about homosexuality that defined marriage this way. So it's hard to say they were acting on anti-gay animus. And we had societies that were okay with same-sex relationships, but still didn't think they were marriages. And it's odd to think that that's gonna be because of anti-gay animus. So the Sixth Circuit Court also points this out. They say, look, we don't have to deny that there has been anti-gay bigotry in the United States, but they say that, quote, the traditional definition of marriage goes back thousands of years and spans almost every society in human history, um, we cannot deny that the institution of marriage arose independently of this record of discrimination. So you don't have to say there's never been anti-gay discrimination to conclude that marriage isn't one of those instances. So let me move on 
to the rational basis test and then strict scrutiny. Because for this, this gets to the meaty part of the lecture. Because those who are going to argue that there's no rational basis for marriage whatsoever um, seem to have their heads in the sand as to the reasons why every society throughout human history and across the globe have recognized marriage in this way. And so I want to highlight that. And I want to start by saying that the arguments I'll make here are going to be just from philosophy and social science. Uh, if I appeal to history, it'll just be as a way of illustrating the rationality that was embedded in a historical practice. So if you've read your Alistair McIntyre, you know that there's some rationality of traditions. The traditions, uh, they transmit rationality, they embody rationality. And so we can ask, well, why, why did that tradition develop? Was it just irrational or was it acting on good reasons? But let me start by saying that those who are in favor of what they call marriage equality have a wonderful slogan. Um, they've done a great job of marketing. Marriage equality fits on a bumper sticker, you can put up a red equal sign on your Facebook or on your Twitter account, but it's utterly vacuous. It means nothing. Everyone in this auditorium tonight is in favor of marriage equality. We all want the law to treat all marriages equally. What we have a disagreement about is what sort of consenting adult relationship is a marriage? So the reason we titled our Harvard article, the reason we titled our book, What is Marriage? It's because that's the central question in this debate that the other side frequently refuses to answer. They will simply appeal to marriage equality as if that settles the discussion. But as the Sixth Circuit and as Justice Sotomayor pointed out, what's your limiting principle? Equality to which relationships? Is it every consenting adult relationship that gets to go by marriage? If not, why not? What's your vision of marriage? So when we started doing research for our article and then for the book, we just started reading through what the leading advocates of redefining marriage were saying in their own voice. And what we saw was that their vision of marriage viewed marriage as mainly about an intense emotional relationship with caregiving and with an option of raising children. What set marriage apart from other types of uh, companionship relationship was the intensity or the degree or the priority of the relationship. It's what one of our critics, a philosopher, John Corvino calls your number one person. Marriage is the relationship that establishes who your number one person is. We argue that this vision of marriage simply gets marriage wrong. That it can't explain the traditional marital norms that we've honored in Western law and culture, and it can't explain why the state's in the marriage business. And let me just briefly highlight these. They'll come up again. But one, if marriage is just about consenting adult romance, an intense emotional union, why would it have to be permanent? Emotions can wax and wane, they can come and they can go, you can fall in love, you can fall out of love. Why shouldn't marriage only last as long as the love lasts? What is it about the marital relationship that requires that pledge of permanency? If marriage is primarily about a consenting adult, a romantic union with caregiving, why is it sexually exclusive? Some people may find that their romantic unions are enhanced by having the freedom to seek out sexual fulfillment with other people. And so why would marriage require sexual exclusivity if it's primarily an emotional, romantic union? Maybe you choose sexual exclusivity if, if you think it will enhance your emotional union, but maybe you don't choose it if you think it will get in the way. And then lastly, why would marriage be a monogamous union if it's just about consenting adult romance and caregiving? As the court had pointed out, three people can agree to live with each other and love each other and take care of each other what would require marriage to be monogamous if it's simply that vision of marriage? And then lastly, why is the state in the marriage business? If marriage is simply about consenting adult love, why couldn't we get the government out of the bedroom? So what we argued in the opening uh, section of the book is that this vision of marriage simply gets marriage wrong. It, it turns marriage into contract law. It dissolves marriage into consent. So it's just like any other adult relationship. We also point out uh, in the very opening of the book that there's nothing distinctively homosexual about this vision of marriage. It's not as if there's a vision of gay marriage and then there's a vision of straight marriage. This vision of marriage informs many heterosexuals. This vision of marriage as consenting adult romance and caregiving is the vision of marriage that our culture has promoted for the past 40 or 50 years. This is the vision of marriage that comes out of the sexual revolution. 
This is the vision of marriage that gave rise to the hookup culture and out of wedlock childbearing and the increase of divorce and um, no fault divorce, the epidemic of pornography. Go through a list. It's a vision of marriage that says consenting adults should do what consenting adults want to do. It hasn't been a particularly good vision of marriage. So in no way do I want to suggest that somehow um, gays and lesbians are to blame for this. No, what gays and lesbians did was they said, look, you guys have already embraced this bad vision of marriage. We just now want to be included. But if you think this is a bad vision of marriage, so they, they just took the logic of the thing to its logical conclusion. But it's not as if they created that logic. Someone in the 60s developed this vision of marriage, pushed it through the media, pushed it in our popular culture. It wreaked havoc for a number of Americans. We'll get to that uh, later in tonight's talk. And now they're trying to solidify that vision of marriage by formally, legally enshrining it in law, by redefining what marriage is. But if you think the increase in out of wedlock childbearing and the increase in divorce and the hookup culture and all of these things have been uh, detrimental changes. They're not progressive changes, they're bad changes. Why would you want to double down on them? You would want to make reforms. You wouldn't want to enshrine that vision into law. So that's the um, basic argument. There are two different visions of marriage on offer here. There's this new vision of marriage that it's about consenting adult romance and caregiving. And then there's a traditional vision of marriage, which I'm about to unpack. The Constitution is silent as to which of these visions is the true vision, which of these visions is the best vision. And so where the Constitution is silent, judges shouldn't pretend that the Constitution speaks. This debate should be settled democratically. And it should be settled in favor of the truth about marriage. And here's how we approach that. So this will be the what is marriage part. I'm going to uh, explore this in three basic uh, uh, headings. What is marriage? Why does marriage matter? And then what are the consequences of redefining marriage? And then we'll go to Q&A. What we do in the book is we follow Aristotle's methodology. And Aristotle uh, suggests that you can analyze any type of community by looking to three factors of the community. Look at the actions that the community engage in, look at the goods that the community seek, and look at the norms that the community lives by. Uh, I think we illustrate this in the book by using a sports team, athletic community, but since I'm at a university, let me use an academic community. Academic communities engage in academic actions. What are academic actions? The bread and butter of university life are the delivering of lectures and then attending lectures and taking notes. It's the research that take place in libraries, uh, going in the stacks and reading books and then writing journal articles, writing your own books, the things that your professors do, and then it's students reading those books and reading those articles when they show up on your syllabus the next year. Uh, it's about attending discussion sessions and seminar sessions, debating ideas, writing term papers, your professors then grade those term papers. You go to office hours to discuss the papers. Those are the sort of actions that make a university a university. It's the wrestling with ideas. It's the investigation of evidence. It's the reading, the writing, the lecturing, the listening, the note taking, the give and take of argument. What are all of those actions ordered towards? All of those actions are ordered towards the truth. They're ordered towards the good of knowledge. It's not about puffing up your opinion or pride. It's not about def defending whatever your preconceived uh, views are just because they're your views. It's actually about eliminating ignorance from your life and appropriating the truth, a truth that can set you free. I mean, so this is the liberal arts part of education is that the liberal arts are liberating. They're actually gonna eliminate error from your life. So the whole point of all those actions, the research, the writing, the lectures, the homework assignments, the exams, the seminar papers, it's all to help you think through these questions so that you can discover the truth. Which then leads to the third part. What are the norms that you live by in a university? This is where things like the honor code and academic honesty and citing all of your sources and not plagiarizing your papers and not data mining if you're a scientist, but reporting all of the data, citing all of your sources precisely so that another scholar could then look at your work and if you've made a mistake, point it out to you. And then you wouldn't interpret uh, that critique as something that's offensive. You would interpret it as something that is, um, uh, you'd be grateful. It's assisting you. It's helping you discover the truth more effectively. This is what universities should look like. 
Uh, Franciscan probably looks more like this than most places. Some places really are just propaganda machines that exist to defend preconceived opinions with indoctrination. But that's not what classical liberal arts colleges and universities are about. You engage in academic actions, order towards an academic good, the truth, knowledge of the truth, within commitments or norms of academic integrity. All right, let's apply that basic structure to marriage. What makes marriage different than a university, different than a corporation, different than a sports team? We say that marriage is a comprehensive relationship, and it's comprehensive in exactly those three steps. It's comprehensive in the act that unites spouses, it's comprehensive in the goods that spouses are ordered towards, and it's comprehensive in the norms that spouses live by. It's comprehensive in the commitments that spouses make to one another. So we say it's a comprehensive act, an act that unites spouses at all levels of their uh, humanity, a union of hearts, minds, and bodies. So it's not just an emotional union. We then say it's a comprehensive good, it orders spouses towards the mutual care of each other, but also the creation and then raising of new human beings. As comprehensive of a good as you can get in this life. And then lastly, we say it's governed by comprehensive commitments, a commitment that's comprehensive throughout time, that pledge of permanency, and a commitment that's comprehensive at every moment of time, the pledge of exclusivity. Let me unpack this, and like I said, this is the most a meaty part of the talk, this is the densest part of the talk, is the more pejorative way of describing it. Um, but if we get through this, it will be smooth sailing afterwards. So we start by saying, all right, marriage unites spouses comprehensively. There's an action that unites spouses comprehensively. What does that mean? And we start by unpacking this to say, well, if it's gonna unite spouses in a comprehensive way, it needs to unite them at all levels of their humanity. And because human beings aren't just ghosts and machines, we're not just spirits that somehow inhabit bodies, but we're in souled bodies or we're in flesh souls. However you wanna think of it, we're a mind-body unity, a psychosomatic unity, to use the jargon. Because that's what we are, to unite comprehensively with another person will require uniting with that other person at all of those levels. Ordinary friendships are unions of hearts and minds. But a marital relationship will be a union of hearts, minds, and bodies. So that then raises the question, well, how do you unite bodily with another person? If I stick my finger in your ear, have we united bodily? <laughs> the laughter suggests that we haven't. <laughs> and it gives me time to take a drink. So if not sticking the finger in your ear, well, what is it that makes you unite bodily with another person? To answer that question, we say, well, what is it that about each and every one of us that makes us one body? What is it that makes me one body? And the answer that we give there is that it's that all of my various uh, bodily systems are unified with each other towards the common good of my bodily life. My heart, my lungs, kidney, skeletal system, lungs, um, muscles, bones, I mentioned that with skeletal system, skin, all those things are coordinating, integrating with each other towards my common life. This is why the unborn child is not just a clump of cells, the way that some people will derogatorily refer to the unborn child. The unborn child has all those same systems that I just described, coordinating with each other, developing the unborn child to the next stage of development. That's how we know it's not like a clump of cells. It's actually an organism, because there's organization, there's unity, there's coordination. Now, all of the systems that I just mentioned we're each complete as individuals. Respiration, we're each breathing on our own. Digestion, if you had dinner before you came here, you're digesting on your own. Um, circulation, your heart is pumping, your blood is circulating. Locomotion, when this is over, you're all gonna get up and walk out if you're on your own. We're all one body, one organism with respect to all of those bodily functions. There's one bodily function that we're each radically incomplete with respect to. That to perform this single act requires a mated unit. There's one biological function that requires a unity so that when the Hebrew scriptures talk about the two becoming one flesh, they're not simply speaking metaphorically or poetically. It's not as if, well, they're so in love with each other, it's as if they became one flesh. They're actually revealing something true. They're revealing a metaphysical and biological truth that when a man and a woman unite in the marital act, 
they truly become one body. So much so that nine months later it might require a name. <laughs> Which can begin to tell you something about the good that marriage is inherently ordered towards. In the same way that academic actions were ordered towards the academic good of knowledge of the truth, so too the marital act is intrinsically ordered towards the marital good, a comprehensive good, both the uh, union of the spouses, but also the creation and then the raising of new human life. And so if you think there's a comprehensive act that unites spouses at all levels of their humanity, so too there's a comprehensive good that spouses are ordered towards. That sets apart the marital relationship from universities and business communities and sports teams. None of those three communities are ordered towards the creation and raising of new human life. That's not the telos of any of those. Uh, um, you know, if, if your university happens to be running um, uh, an adoption agency, that's unique. That's not normally what universities do. If your sports team happens to also be running an orphanage, that's unheard of. It's the norm for men and women to unite as husband and wife and then become mothers and fathers. That gives the institution of marriage parts of its rationale. So that the lovemaking act is also the life-giving act. And it tells us something about the comprehensive act and what it's ordered towards, the comprehensive good. And then to be um, kind of uh, reasonable, conscientious parents, you're engaged in a comprehensive good of raising that new human life to appreciate human goodness in all of its forms. Think of all the different varieties that goodness can come in. Appreciating beauty, appreciating friendship, appreciating knowledge, appreciating athleticism and sports and music and art and drama, all of those things. If you're gonna be a conscientious parent, you're gonna to wanna to encourage your child to appreciate goodness in all of its forms. And so it's both the creating of life and then raising life that gives marriage its comprehensive horizon. This then explains why marriage has comprehensive commitments. None of you have made a comprehensive commitment to your freshman year roommate, <laughs> thankfully. That is not a till death do you part institution. I'm grateful for that as well. But marriage does require that. Even apart from what the spouses may desire, for to be a marriage, it needs to include that pledge of permanency. And why does marriage require that pledge of permanency? Precisely because if, in order to be a comprehensive commitment, a comprehensive union, you can't hold anything back. And so the language of John Paul II, this is the total gift. He had a theological, also it's a philosophical way in which he uh, describes it. We put it in a more Aristotelian context. It's the same basic reality, which I'll get to in a minute as well. So that's the comprehensive aspect of marriage throughout time. It's also comprehensive at every moment in time. To comprehensive unite with another person means forsaking all others, being an exclusive union. This vision of marriage can also explain why the type of exclusivity that marriage calls for is sexual exclusivity. None of you are cheating on your spouse by attending this lecture without your spouse. Marriage doesn't call for academic exclusivity. Or if you play tennis with someone other than your spouse, it doesn't call for athletic exclusivity. But if you sleep with someone other than your spouse, you violated the norm of exclusivity. <clears throat> Marriage calls for sexual exclusivity because it's the sexual act, the marital act, that transforms an ordinary friendship of union of hearts and minds into a marital relationship, a comprehensive relationship of union of hearts, minds, and bodies. And that's why the type of exclusivity that marriage calls for is gonna be sexual exclusivity. Now when I mentioned uh, John Paul, I was saying that you know, he had his own framework and idiom uh, for describing these things. What we've seen is that thinkers throughout human history and across the globe have more or less viewed marriage as something very similar to this. If you look at the ancient Greeks and Romans, Aristotle, Plato, Rusinius, Rufus, Cicero, if you look at uh, Christians like Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin. You look at modern thinkers, Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Kant, Eastern thinkers like Gandhi. They all phrase their account of marriage within their own particular traditions, with their own theological or philosophical or political framework, vocabulary. They don't use my jargon. But they all are grasping at something like this, and they're trying to articulate it within their own 
traditions because they're all recognizing something about human nature. They're all recognizing certain facts about the human condition and certain um, potentialities that are there that can then be actualized in this relationship that we call marriage. And so I point to that historical fact to say that fact is the embodiment of the rationality of a social practice, the practice of marriage. And we try to unpack that in the book. But let me move on so we can get to Q&A, because the next question is going to be, well, why does this matter? You know, let's say we agree with what you've said so far. The Constitution itself doesn't settle the marriage issue because the Constitution is silent, and none of the various provisions of the Constitution would require states to redefine marriage. You agree with that part. And now let's say you agree that, well, the revisionists don't have a particularly good vision of marriage. You agree with that part. You've given us a more philosophically sound account of marriage. It's a comprehensive union of sexually complementary spouses that's ordered towards um, the bearing and then rearing of children within the context of monogamy, exclusivity, and pregnancy. The next logical question to ask is, well, why does it matter? Maybe you're right that this is what marriage is in some philosophical, metaphysical sense. Why does the state care about this definition? Why should Ohio continue to define marriage in this way. Um, let me answer that by pointing out that the states in the marriage business to try to get a man and a woman to commit to each other permanently and exclusively so that any children that that relationship has will have a mother and a father. That from the state's perspective, marriage is based on an anthropological truth that men and women are distinct and complementary. It's based on a biological fact that reproduction requires both a man and a woman and it's based on the social reality that children deserve both a mom and a dad. Those are three secular truths that I just pointed to. And that explains the secular function of marriage in law. Whenever a baby is born, a mother is always close by. She's normally in the same room. <laughs> That's a fact of biology. The question for law and the question for culture is, will a father be close by? And if so, for how long? Marriage is the institution that societies all across the globe, all throughout human history, devise to maximize the likelihood that that man commits to that woman, and then the two of them committed to each other commit to that child. And the reason why this matters is that when it doesn't happen, or when it falls apart prematurely, the social consequences run high. And to explain why the social consequences run high, we have to understand that there's no such thing as parenting. There's mothering and there's fathering. Men and women bring different gifts to the parenting enterprise. David Popano, a sociologist at Rutgers University, did a study of what social scientists know about gendered parenting. And he concluded, quote, the burden of social science evidence supports the idea that gender differentiated parenting is important for human development and that the contribution of fathers to child rearing is unique and irreplaceable. We should disavow the notion that mommies can make good daddies, just as we should disavow the popular notion that daddies can make good mommies. The two sexes are different to the core, and each is necessary culturally and biologically for the optimal development of a human being." End quote. Let me illustrate what Popano was getting at with a thought experiment. If I tell you it's Saturday morning, and a five-year-old boy is in the living room, wrestling with one of his parents, and this parent is teaching the five-year-old boy how to be masculine without being violent. That it's okay to put people in headlocks. It's not okay to bite or to pull hair or to gouge out eyes. <laughs> Which parent is most likely in the living room? And the nervous laughter gives it away. It's the mom. Of course not. It's most likely going to be the father. Who's wrestling in the living room carpet with a five-year-old boy? It's normally the dad, not because we've engaged in gender stereotypes in which we tell women they can't wrestle with boys on carpets and that only dads can. So this is what comes naturally to fathers. It's what fathers enjoy doing with their five-year-old sons. It's the same way that fathers enjoy throwing kids up in the air and moms say, honey, not so high. <laughs> it's something that comes naturally to mothers, partly probably because they've carried a child in the womb for nine months, it sets them up to be more um, concerned, more compassionate. <laughs> They're more sensitive to these sorts of things. Now, that's the five-year-old boy with the father in the living room. We see the 10-year-old boy in the backyard tossing a football or playing catch. Um, we see the 15-year-old boy getting ready for a high school dance with his father. 
all those things, the father is helping his boy develop into a man, a law-abiding, productive member of society. So when we take a step back from the anecdotes, we see the social science, boys who grow up without their fathers more likely to commit crime, less likely to graduate high school, more likely to spend time in jail, less likely to spend time employed. Fathers then do something complimentary for their daughters. Fathers tend to be the ones that scare away bad boyfriends. <laughs> uh, they tend to police who's dating their daughter. Partly this is because fathers on average and for the most part tend to be larger than mothers. Um, partly it's because fathers on average and for the most part tend to have deeper voices than mothers. Partly it's because on average and for the most part fathers used to be young boys themselves and so they know what the wrong sort of young man might be looking for in their daughter. So they're more sensitive to that aspect. So when we take, and then I should add before, um, fathers who are married to their daughter's mother model, model what a good male-female relationship looks like, um, give their daughters something to look for in a potential boyfriend, fiance, husband. Take a step back from the anecdote, look at the data. We see that girls who grow up without their fathers more likely to engage in sexual activity earlier in life, more likely to have a pregnancy outside of marriage. But don't just take my words for those uh, social science stats. Let me read you a quote, and then I'll ask you who the speaker was. Quote, we know the statistics. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves and the foundations of our community are weaker because of it." End quote. Who was the speaker? President Obama. And now you might ask yourself, why was President Obama speaking out on the importance of fathers? Because he's done this several times during his presidency. He answered the question when he uh, gave a commencement address at the all-male graduating class of Morehouse College. He says, quote, I have tried to be for Michelle and my girls what my father was not for my mother and me. I want to break that cycle. Now I point to President Obama to say that this should uh, send a signal that it's not as if if you grow up outside of an intact married mother-father household that you're somehow destined to fail in life. Um, President Obama is doing pretty well for himself. But even President Obama would be one of the first to say that he had a tougher road in life because his father wasn't involved. That's why he wants to break that cycle. That's why he wants to be for Michelle and his girls what his father wasn't for his mother and for him. So with social science, we never will make it seem like, well, you know, the odds are against you, therefore you're destined to fail. That's not the case. But we also don't want to be kind of um, blasé about the reality that a child who grows up without a married mom and dad does have a tougher road in life. And this then explains why the state's in the marriage business. It's not because it's a sucker for romance. It's not because the government cares about your love life. It's not because the government cares about the butterflies that you get in your stomach when you fall in love. Valentine's Day is, doesn't explain why the government's in the marriage business. The state's in the marriage business because the union of a man and a woman can produce a child and that child deserves a mom and a dad. And when that doesn't happen, either because the union never formed in the first place or because it falls apart prematurely, social costs run high. And we've seen this in terms of, for those children, an increase in child poverty, a decrease in social mobility, an increase in crime, the explosion of our welfare state. Look at welfare spending over the past 50 years. So everything that you could care about, if you care about social justice and you care about limited government, if you care about the poor and you care about freedom, is better served by a healthy, intact marriage culture than by big government programs that try to pick up the pieces, whether it's the form of the police state or the welfare state. A police state being the discipliner, the welfare state being the provider. So, you could say that you're tracking with me up to that. So you see why the Constitution is silent so the people should get to vote. You see why the revisionist account of marriage fails. You see what the uh, alternative kind of Aristotelian approach that we've taken 
defines marriage as you know, a comprehensive union of sexually complementary spouses. You can see why the state cares about it because it can produce children. Children need a mom and a dad, and we need an institution that gets men and women to commit to each other permanently and exclusively so that kids have a mom and a dad. But your next question is likely to be, but what's the harm if we just redefine marriage to allow Adam and Steve to get married? How does redefining marriage change any of that? All of that would still be true and it would still take place just fine if we also allowed gays and lesbians to participate in marriage. Let me give three uh, responses to that and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and answers. All three responses fall under the general rubric of ideas have consequences and bad ideas have bad consequences. Um, that what will be happening if you redefine marriage that you will replace one vision of what marriage is with a different vision of what marriage is. And the law will teach that one of those visions is true and one of those visions is false. And then people will live out one or the other of those visions. In brief, the law teaches by shaping culture. The law shapes our culture. Our culture in turn shapes our beliefs. Our beliefs shape our actions. And so if the law teaches either the truth about marriage or a lie about marriage, we will see that then embodied in our social practices. That'll be the lived reality. Let me go through three ways in which this will take place. First, if you redefine marriage to say it's a genderless institution, there'll be no public institution left that upholds even the ideal that every child deserves a mother and a father. In fact, to say a child deserves a mother and a father will be relegated as hate speech. Redefining marriage to make it a genderless institution teaches that men and women are interchangeable so that mothers and fathers are replaceable. It sends a signal that marriage is primarily about consenting adult romance rather than both consenting adult romance and an intergenerational relationship. So marriage historically has been about both the love between the spouses, a horizontal relationship, but also the generativity relationship, the vertical relationship, generativity creating and then uniting a next generation with the man and the woman who created that generation. So it shifts one vision of marriage for another. And if you doubt the law has this capacity to teach, consider the experiment of no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce is when we redefine marriage the first time in American life. In the common law tradition, marriage was a permanent relationship, uh, but for a severe reason, you could file for divorce. The common law has a nice little uh, moniker to classify these things. There were the three A's of common law, um, abuse, abandonment, and adultery. Serious reasons for saying a relationship that was supposed to be permanent would have to be declared by the law to be over. My spouse is abusing me, my spouse committed adultery, my spouse has abandoned me. With no fault divorce, you could now abandon your spouse for any reason at all. In fact, you didn't even have to cite fault. So it could be for no reason, not just for any reason, but for no reason. Some legal scholars refer to no-fault divorce as unilateral no-fault divorce because you don't even need the consent of your spouse. So no fault, no consent, divorce. There's nothing like this in any other aspect of our contract law. You don't get no fault, uh, unilateral no-fault get out of your plumbing contract. <laughs> Um, you have a greater legal obligation to your plumber or your roofer in most jurisdictions than you do to your spouse. Um, you're going to pay your plumber what you agreed to unless he consents to get out of the contract or he did something with fault. He installed leaky pipes. Otherwise, there's no such thing as unilateral no fault. Get out of your plumbing contract. What we saw in the decades after the introduction of no fault divorce is that divorce rates in the United States more than doubled. Now, part of that was from the culture itself. I mean, the culture shapes our laws just as much as our laws shape our culture. It's a symbiotic relationship, which is why I don't like talk of which one is upstream and downstream. They both impact each other. It's more like a tide. Um, but what we saw was that there was a bad vision of marriage that the 60s gave us. That then led to the introduction of no-fault divorce laws, which then solidified a bad vision of marriage so that now people will get out of their marriages for frivolous reasons. One other uh, historical point I'll mention is that 50 years ago, when Moynihan wrote his famous report on the black family, Moynihan was pointing out that births to single mothers in the United States were approaching 25% for, uh, 
for African American children. And he thought this was going to be the greatest social justice issue of our time. That whereas uh, the black family had stayed intact during the evils of slavery and Jim Crow, something was now going on that was dissolving the black family. Conservatives argued that it was the welfare state. He didn't quite make that argument, but he still thought that it was a problem. What's going on? He pointed out that the uh, birth rate to single mothers in the general population was in single digit digits, but for African Americans it was at 25%. Fast forward 50 years to today. Today, 40% of all children are born to single mothers, 50% of Hispanics, and over 70% of African Americans are born to single moms. These children have done nothing wrong in life, but they will face a much more challenging road in life. So the question becomes, if you think the greatest social justice issue of our time is uniting those 40%, 50%, and 70% of children with their fathers, how do we as a culture insist that fathers are essential when the law has redefined marriage to make fathers optional? That's the first consequence of the legal redefinition of marriage. Second consequence is that there's no logical reason for the redefinition of marriage to stop here. I highlighted that partly with the Sixth Circuit opinion, but let me just mention to you three words that activists have coined to actually describe where they would like to see marriage go next. The first is the term thruple. A thruple is a three-person couple. Uh, take the word couple, chop off the C, and then add a THR. Uh, my co-authors and I came across this word in New York Magazine. New York Magazine is a publication for elites in New York City. We've set, subsequently seen it in the Washingtonian Magazine, a magazine for elites in Washington. And what it was doing is it was profiling a polyamorous relationship. Polyamory is different than polygamy. With polygamy, it's like a bicycle wheel with a hub and spokes. One man with woman number one, one man with woman number two, one man with woman number three. That's polygamy. Polyamory, it's group marriage. They're all married to each other. So a thruple is a version of a polyamorous relationship. And what New York Magazine was profiling was three guys who lived with each other and loved each other. They wanted to have a joint banking account. They wanted to have all three names on the mortgage. They wanted to visit each other in the hospital. They slept in the same bed. They cooked meals for each other. They loved each other. And if love equals love, why can't you add one more equal sign and say love equals love equals love? If you go before the US Supreme Court and you say, I am suing for marriage equality for the same sex couple, on what basis would you deny marriage equality to the same sex thruple or the opposite sex quartet? The way that we arrived at monogamy in Western law and culture is that it's one man and one woman who can unite in the act that can create new life, and every new life has one mother and one father. Marriage is about uniting those people in a stable, exclusive, permanent union. But once you say the male-female part of marriage is irrational, arbitrary, bigoted, what is your rational basis for requiring monogamy? What's magical about the number two once you say the male-female part is irrational? So that's the challenge of the thruple. Uh, the next term we came across was the word monogamish. Monogamish is a play on the word monogamous. Um, this was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, probably the most prominent publication in American public life. If you're a public figure, you want to be profiled in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. If you're a writer, you want to write for the New York Times Sunday Magazine. This was a profile of the gay rights activist Dan Savage. And at one point during the interview, they said, well, what can straight couples learn from gay couples? And he pointed out well, they could learn the virtue of the monogamish relationship, which is a union of two people, but it's sexually open. The title of the profile was Married, comma, with Infidelities. So they were redefining the vice of infidelity as a virtue of an open relationship. And he was saying, the problem with marriage in the United States is that we have this outdated, inhumane, backwards view that two people ought to be sexually exclusive till death do them part. You know, it's fine if people choose that, but it shouldn't be normative. It shouldn't be expected that provided there's no coercion or deceit, so as long as you're open and honest about it, spouses should be free and in fact encouraged to have open, sexually open relationships. 
There's no reason to think that one person can satisfy all of your sexual needs for the rest of your life, and many marriages fall apart precisely because they aren't satisfying all of those needs. This is his argument, not mine. Um, so the argument was that marriage, understood as an intense emotional caregiving relationship, could actually be enhanced if you liberated sexual exclusivity from it, if you allowed spouses to seek out sexual fulfillment in other relationships. <coughs> Last term I'll mention is the term wed lease. Wed lease is a play on the word wedlock. If wedlock denotes something that's strong and sturdy and permanent, wed lease is meant to denote the exact opposite. Just like you can lease a car or lease a house, you should be able to lease a spouse. Uh, this was an attorney writing in the Washington Post. The Washington Post is the reasonable uh, liberal newspaper. And it's not the New York Times or the LA Times. The Washington Post is the reasonable one. And this lawyer was saying that the problem with marriage law is that it's permanent. But nothing in life is permanent. It's so transitory, so transient. What we need is to have a temporary marriage regime. So you should have the option of signing up for a wed lease rather than wedlock. A five or a 10 year marriage contract which could be renewed on good behavior. <laughs> but if it's not going well, after five years, it just automatically terminates. Um, and none of, his argument was that you wouldn't have any of the uh, turmoil, any of the heartbreak, any of the tragedy of divorce, because you only signed up for wed lease in the first place. But the reason divorce is so traumatic is that you signed up for an unrealistic uh, type of a union, yet an unrealistic <laughs> expectation that you and this other person would love each other and care for each other for the rest of your lives. And when, inevitably, you were unable to live up to your unrealistic expectation, that's when your heart breaks, that's when your life falls apart. Much better to have realistic expectations, the argument goes. Sign up for a wed lease. Okay, I said at the beginning I wasn't gonna talk about theology. I wasn't even really gonna talk about um, personal morality. So. I will leave it to your judgment to evaluate the morality and the theology of throuples and wed leases and monogamous relationships. And I have full confidence that you will do that appropriately. I just want to highlight the public policy consequence. Remember, I was arguing that the reason the state is in the marriage business is to ensure that a man and a woman commit to each other permanently and exclusively so that any children that they help produce will have a mother and a father. But the throuple, the wed lease, the monogamous relationship, they all directly undercut that purpose of marriage. Because what those three um, redefinitions do is they increase the number of sexual partners that men and women have. The throuple, the uh, uh, monogamous relationship, they increase the number of sexual partners. And then they decrease the amount of commitment. An open relationship, a temporary relationship, not very committed relationship. So increase the number of sexual partners, decrease the amount of commitment, that's a recipe for fragmented families and fatherless children. And yet all three of these redefinitions as a logical matter follow as night follows on day once you get rid of the male-female procreative aspect part of marriage. So that's the second consequence of redefining marriage. Let me move on to the third. This is what I'll close with and then we'll go to Q&A. This is the consequence that we've been experiencing um, most uh, acutely, uh, most immediately. This is the consequence for religious liberty. And the basic rubric here is that if you redefine marriage to say it's a genderless institution and that those who think it's a gendered institution are irrational bigots, the law will treat those people as irrational bigots. And you only have to ask the question of, well, how does the law treat other forms of irrational bigotry to see what will be in store for people who continue to believe that marriage is a male-female union. People who continue to believe the truth will be treated like they're irrational bigots. Um, let me just highlight uh, some of these. Um, where to begin, actually, for this? I could do a whole talk on this. I'll start with the Catholic Charity Adoption Agencies. They have been forced to stop providing adoption services to children in the state of Massachusetts, in the state of Illinois, in the city of San Francisco, and in the District of Columbia, where I live. The governments of those various jurisdictions said that it's discriminatory 
to refuse to place children in same-sex married households. Um, that it's okay to favor marriage over non-marriage, but you have to treat all marriages the same. And so once same-sex marriages or civil unions in some cases, uh, I think in Illinois civil unions were there for a year before same-sex marriage, but the basic idea was once you had their legal regime of state recognition for the same-sex relationship, you had to treat it in the same way as you treated marriage. And that if you didn't do this, it was viewed as discrimination, and you can't get an adoption license to run an adoption agency unless you comply with the non-discrimination law. So these are Catholic charity adoption agencies who are taking care of widows and orphans long before the government was taking care of widows and orphans. Um, that's part of medieval uh, history also that I think some politicians forget. So the church was taking care of widows and orphans long before uh, the government was. And the government is now saying, well, you can't do it in accordance with your own beliefs unless you place children with same-sex couples. The church's response was, look, we're not trying to prevent gays and lesbians from adopting from other agencies. They can go to the secular humanist adoption agency. They can go to the Episcopalian adoption agency. They can go to the state-run adoption agency. We're just asking for the freedom to find homes with married moms and dads for the children that have been entrusted to us. And the government said no. This does absolutely nothing to help children. It doesn't make it more likely that more children find homes. All it does is score a point for political correctness, and it uses children as pawns in an adult culture war. In addition to that, we've seen uh, bakers, florists, photographers, a series of professionals who professional uh, vocations intersect with the wedding industry uh, be sued and then penalized by the government for declining to help celebrate a same-sex wedding. And what's important to note about these cases is that in none of these situations was the photographer, the baker, or the florist saying, I refuse to serve gay people. That's not what was going on. Uh, in many cases, they had been serving gay and lesbian customers with a long track record. One of them were actually sued by a gay couple that they had been providing flowers to for about a decade. They were doing get well soon flowers, happy birthday flowers, things like that. But when they were asked to do the wedding flowers, they had to decline. And then the state attorney general of Oregon sued uh, Baronel Stutzman, a 70-year-old lady, a grandmother, who had been serving this gay couple for a decade for violating the non-discrimination statute. About a month ago, uh, the, the judge that is administering this case said that she can be sued in both her professional and her personal capacity. So her home, all of her assets, her retirement, health, those are all fair game um, for what she might be penalized with. Uh, last week, a judge ruled that there's a bakery out of, um, maybe the bakery's in Oregon and the florist is in Washington State. One's in one, one's in the other. I have trouble keeping them straight. But so there's a bakery in Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Masterpiece Cake Shop. And uh, the judge last week ruled that they can be uh, tried under a more expansive ruling. They can potentially be fined up to $150,000. That's what the potential penalty is here for declining to bake a wedding cake. There's a case of a Catholic couple in upstate New York that own and operate a farm. And it's a type of farm that has like fall festivals and apple picking and um, pumpkin patches and hay rides, things like that. They also do about a dozen weddings a year in their barn. And the Catholic couple live on the second and the third floor of the barn. They rent out the first floor about 12 times a year for a wedding. They were asked by a lesbian couple, can we get married in your house? And of course, they had to say no. They're like, we can't have a gay wedding in our house. That would violate our beliefs about marriage and what we view as our obligations to God to bear witness to the truth. They were sued under the New York State Human Rights Statute. Uh, they were found guilty of having violated the human rights of the same-sex couple. They were ordered to pay a $13,000 fine. And they were told that for each additional time they refused to allow a same-sex couple to wed in their barn, they would be liable for lawsuit again. So they have just decided to no longer do weddings at their barn. This is not a live and let live movement. It's not as if conservative Christians have a monopoly on cake baking and floral arranging and photography. In all these jurisdictions, there were photographers, bakers, florists who, one, were in favor of gay marriage, and two, were in favor of making a profit. So you could have said, just leave this to the private sector, leave this to the market, leave this to liberty, live and let live. 
Um, if this particular baker doesn't want to make you a cake, go to a different baker. You know, I wouldn't even trust the baker to do a good job. Why would you want to have someone who disagrees with your wedding be the one that helps celebrate the wedding? It only gets worse, though. Um, and then I'll stop with these last uh, stories. Um, three that I want to mention, uh, and I'll go in chronological order. Last spring, the president of Gordon College signed a letter to President Obama that was signed by other university presidents saying, if you issue an executive order uh, banning what you call discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity for government contract recipients, can you include a religious liberty exemption for a school like Gordon? That's why he was signing the letter. The letter became public, and the accreditation agency for New England schools said we're now going to have to investigate whether or not Gordon College deserves to be a four-year accredited university. Because when they saw that the president had signed on this letter, they looked into what Gordon's campus policies were. And Gordon has uh, a code of conduct for students and faculty and staff saying that they expect chastity of all members of the Gordon community. They understand chastity to be sexual relations are reserved for the marital relationship, marriage is the union of a man and a woman. The accrediting agency says, well, this seems to be discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. And so Gordon is now under a one-year internal review process to determine whether or not it should change its code of conduct. And if not, the threat is you might lose your accreditation. And if you're not an accredited college, um, your degree won't help you get into law school. You won't be eligible for subsidized student loans. You won't be eligible for the federal grants uh, that fund uh, lots of science laboratories and things like that. The reason the president was asking for the religious liberty exemption in the first place was to make sure that Gordon College wouldn't lose eligibility uh, for government funding for higher education. It's nearly impossible to run a university without ever intersecting with government funds. There are only a handful of schools that do it. Next, uh, in the chronological list, the fire chief of Atlanta was fired from his job for writing a book for his Bible study um, on human sexuality. He leads a men's Bible study at his church. I think it's a Pentecostalist church. Um, they were approaching the topic of uh, sexuality. He wanted to write a book for the men in his Bible study. Two sentences in the entire book made reference to homosexuality. And it made the standard traditional Christian teaching on homosexuality. And for that reason, he was fired. Uh, a little bit of background about this man. He's a 30-plus year veteran of the Atlanta Fire Department. He had served in the Obama administration as the fire administrator of the United States. Um, one of the federal agencies, I didn't know it existed, there's a fire administration. Uh, this guy was the chief firefighter for the nation um, for the Obama administration. He then went back to Atlanta and he was the fire chief. At some point, um, someone noticed that he had written this book. There were these two sentences that were objectionable, and they filed a complaint. It wasn't a current firefighter. It was a former retired firefighter who just didn't like the fact that this fire chief had these politically incorrect views. Um, the mayor said, you know, when it was brought to I'm appalled that someone would say such a thing. This uh, city has no room for discrimination. They did a one-month investigation. They discovered he had never actually discriminated against anyone. But they said that he violated protocol in self-publishing a book without permission. He says that he had the permission of the ethics office before he published the book. But what's more important is what the New York Times said about this. The New York Times says it doesn't matter that the internal report found that the fire chief had never discriminated against gays or lesbians in the fire for, uh, department. Merely having the view makes him unacceptable. Which leads us to uh, the third example out of California. Two weeks ago, the California State Supreme Court amended the ethics code for all state judges to prohibit any state judge from being the leader in the Boy Scouts, from being a leader, a scout master in the Boy Scouts. Um, they amended the uh, requirements. It says that no judge can be part of any group that engages in, in invidious discrimination, but they used to have an exemption for youth organizations. They removed the youth organization exemption. So it looks like this was very targeted. Removing that exemption, what is the only youth organization uh, that judges would likely be a member of? It's probably the Boy Scouts. How do they argue the Boy Scouts engage in discrimination? While they allow gay scouts, they don't allow gay scout masters. 
They say they don't want to have uh, openly gay scoutmasters in the Boy Scouts. That was the compromise that the Boy Scouts reached about a year or two ago when they changed their policy. California says to be a scoutmaster would make you a participant in discrimination and you can't be a judge if you're a member of such a group. Never mind that this probably violates both the California Constitution and the US Constitution, that public servants, public employees retain their rights for free association and uh, free to exercise of religion. That's how the ethics code was changed. The only uh, thing, I do want to add one more thing out of California, because when I got there, I remembered it. I want to contrast Brendan Eich with Phil Robertson. Uh, Brendan Eich is the founder and former CEO of Mozilla Firefox. Brendan Eich was forced to resign as the CEO of the company he founded because a blogger discovered that six years ago, he had made a $1,000 donation to California's Proposition 8. Prop 8 was the ballot initiative that defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman in California. It passed. It got the majority of votes in California in 2008. But in 2014, a blogger discovered that Ike had donated $1,000 in his private capacity, secretly. No one knew about it for six years. And they started saying that he could no longer be the CEO of a tech company um, because he must hate gay people. He was eventually forced uh, to resign, and the chairman of the board said, you know, we were all so surprised to learn that Brendan had made this donation. Um, none of us had ever experienced him saying anything bigoted or homophobic in our life, and we've never had any complaints about him discriminating against gay employees. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the entire point, and yet you forced him to resign anyway because he had donated money to a political campaign in his personal private capacity. Contrast that, though, with Phil Robertson, because I do want to end on a somewhat hopeful note, even though I realize for the past 20 minutes it's been nothing but depression. Um, <laughs> Phil Robertson was suspended from Duck Dynasty the week before Christmas uh, because in an interview with GQ, he had paraphrased St. Paul using slightly more colorful language than I think <laughs> we would have chosen. But within 48 hours, and also Cracker Barrel then removed any of the Duck Dynasty um, uh, merchandise that included Phil Robertson. Within 48 hours, both A&E, the network that airs Duck Dynasty, and Cracker Barrel had reversed their decision. And the reason why is that the business executives who run A&E and who run Cracker Barrel are out of step with the ordinary Americans who watch a show about duck hunters and who eat country fried steak. <laughs> so when, the, when there was a market mechanism for pushback, the business executive said, we're gonna lose. Um, if we suspend Phil Robertson and if um, the Robertson family takes their show to a different network or if our viewers stop watching and therefore our advertisers aren't getting the bang for their buck, we stand to lose. And so they reinstated Phil Robertson in time for the Duck Dynasty Marathon that ran all day on Christmas and on Christmas Eve. So what that suggests is that um, the elites in this country um, disagree with ordinary Americans. And we see, and actually there was a poll that just came out last week showing that even the majority of Americans who support redefining marriage think that the baker, the florist, and the photographer shouldn't be coerced to violate their beliefs. Ordinary Americans, whether they're for same-sex marriage or against same-sex marriage, think that people should be free of government coercion, harassment, and penalties if they simply believe the traditional definition. But elite America does not. And so what I want to leave with is, is, is this challenge. I think that the way that this um, plays out in the long run is will um, elite Americans view people who believe the truth about marriage the way that they view pro-lifers or the, the way that they view racists? And here's the distinction. When I was at Princeton, most of my classmates, most of my professors said, you know, they disagreed with me about abortion, right? They were pro-choice, but they could at least understand why I was pro-life. And because they could understand why I was pro-life, they were willing to respect the rights of conscience, religious liberty, vis-a-vis -vis abortion. And for most of American history, this has been our solution. Um, after Roe v. Wade became a constitutional right to abortion, but we never said that the pro-life doctor or pro-life nurse had to perform an abortion, or that the pro-life 
uh, organizations had to pay for abortion. What made the Hobby Lobby situation, the HHS mandate, so uh, unique is that it was the first time in the 40 years after Roe that the government was making pro-life citizens complicit in the evil of abortion. And the reason why that hadn't happened up until uh, the Obama administration is that most people would say, even if I disagree with you about abortion, I can at least understand why you are pro-life and therefore I won't make you violate your conscience. Contrast that with racists. I have no idea, it's irrational, it's utterly implausible, it's just a result of bigotry and therefore you don't get rights of conscience or religious liberty. That's the way that you don't ever see religious, ex uh, religious liberty exemption for racism. So that's gonna be the question. The challenge for all of us um, in the future will be, will we be able to embody and express? So embody by the way we live and the families that we form and express by the way we talk and the arguments we make, but also how we uh, respect people who disagree with us, that our vision of marriage isn't irrational animus and bigotry, it's actually founded on the common good, it's founded on a reflection on human nature, basic truths about human nature and the common good. And it's reasonable for us to believe this and the government should respect our freedom to do so. Thank you.